So, I've been gone a little bit. I've met a couple of you this morning who, obviously, by your facial expression, you have no idea who I am. <clears throat> Welcome. I'm grateful that you're here. Um, I hope that I don't disappoint you, but I probably will. Um, my name is Drew. Uh, you'll hear us say this, that I'm one of the pastors here at Church at Maine. There are <clears throat> lots of reasons why uh, we say that that way, but I have a particular role. Rashad has a particular role. Those are distinct, um, and they bleed over from time to time, so you'll hear him preach. You might like him better. Um, too bad I've got the mic today. <laughs> However, in that, I, I want to I do a couple things today. This is a sort of a standalone conversation for today. I want to tell you what happened. Some of you may have had some questions. I've heard about some of your questions about this time that I was off. I left uh, church at Maine uh, alone entirely for over a month. And by alone entirely, I mean phone off, email delete, <clears throat> shut email off, uh, wiped off my phone like I had no clue what was going on here. As a matter of fact, I ran into some of you in different spaces along the way and your face told me that I might wanna know what's going on while I'm, while I'm gone. But, but God taught me uh, a long time ago that if I was going to pursue any form of real rest, that I was going to have to be very disciplined to completely separate myself from everything happening here. And I was able to do that by God's grace. But I wanna share with you how it happened, why it happened, because what I need you to participate in is that it wasn't for me. And over time, you're gonna see that more and more that it wasn't for me. It was never for me. It was for us. Some of you may have had questions about, is Drew looking for another job? No, I was not looking for another job. Some of you might have been wishing Drew was looking for another job. Sorry, I wasn't looking for another job. Some of you, I, I've been told, some asked, you know, was there a moral failure involved? No, no, there wasn't any moral fa Actually, yes, there was in one sense. I very much learned uh, throughout my time away how overwhelmingly anxious, worked up, I've had so many of you this morning have walked up to me saying that I look rested, which immediately insults me. What did I look like before? <laughs> I, I see the mirror. There's not a whole lot of drama here. And you're like noticeably like, Drew, wow, you look really rested. I'm like, man, I must have really been a mess before I left. So, sorry, I had no idea. And that's maybe further to the point of the moral failure conversation. No, there wasn't anything like to report, but I had become far more tired, fearful of people's opinion of me, more so than his, than I realized. And God was giving me a specific opportunity to repent, to genuinely give him all the cards and let him bring back to me what he wants me to play. So no, I'm still here. I'm probably gonna stay for a while. Um, I had no, no, nothing has changed in that regard. So, However, um, much of what was needed was found in some of the most peculiar, at times thoroughly unfortunate, but awfully effective means. I wanna share some of that with you today because what I was able to experience over the last month in being away is for all of us to learn how to practice whether in an hour, in a day, a week, or however we may find time. And it has to do with this word renewal. I wanna share with you where this came from. There was a, a Psalm, Psalm 51. Many of you may know the Psalm. It's, it's when David responds to the prophet Nathan uh, David was a really great king and commonly thought of in Israel's history as the best of the best. He is the mark. And yet, David had this remarkable, noticeable pattern in his life where he was this great leader, great military power, great mind, and also a great big jerk and a horribly, horribly wicked sinner. Look, David did things that all of us should look in our Bibles and, if we're honest, feel pretty ashamed if anything like that were to be attached to our name. It's horrible what he did. And if you want to read more about those things, you should go and look at the books of Samuel and Chronicles and Kings. They'll, they'll show you David's life. You'll see the ups and the downs, and they are incredible to watch. But in his response, Nathan comes to David and, and clears the air about what everybody needs to know, and David goes to God. And in that prayer, David goes to God and he prays these words. Nope, that's not what he prayed. <laughs> he, did not, he did not pray that. Um, um, you may have to clear the background if you need to do that. Um, I wanna read this off of my screen. That should be a, a black background, I apologize. There we go. 
create in me, so he's praying, David's praying, he says, create in me a clean heart. First notifier here, he didn't have one. Godly king, everybody thought he was great. He was leading the nation of Israel and he was leading it in God's rule and reign and yet here is the reality. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And then he uses this word, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, that word right uh, is, is other times, I like the other translations a little better here, is the word steadfast. It's not a word we use a lot, but the word steadfast is super helpful. So let me show you a couple definitions for the word steadfast. To be steadfast, David's prayer is saying, renew in me a steadfast spirit, an inner person, the who I really am before you, God. He says, renew in me a steadfast, a right. Well, what does that mean? It means resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. David's praying, he's saying, I don't wanna be movable anymore. That pretty woman out on the rooftop uh, was a guilty pleasure for me, to a human being that I want to take advantage of. A, a, a momentary lapse in judgment is not even remotely close to what that was. God, I was a horrible, abusive leader who abused my authority to take advantage of other people. And not only that, he had her husband murdered to hide up the pregnancy that he created with Bathsheba. I'm telling you, terrible story. So he's praying and he's saying, I want to have a spirit within me now that is unwavering. Similar words are loyal, faithful, committed, devoted, dedicated, dependable, reliable. So David's praying, he says, I want the inner life here to be like that. No matter who I'm with, no matter who I'm around, God created me a clean heart and renew a spirit within me that is locked on you and you alone. That was David's prayer. And what's important out of that is that David didn't live well leading up to that prayer, but afterwards, David still sinned again. But he was far more than ever before after this, resolutely and confirmed about where his focus needed to be. So my month off needed a sense of this, but there's another word here that we wanted to look at, and it's this word, it's the word renewal. And in the Hebrew, you, that word chadash, it's one of my, I've had it in my, uh, Hillary used to, to get frustrated with me because I had this alarm set at 6 a.m. on my phone. You remember, Hill, the word hadash? And it would just come up all the time. Well, sometimes our phones would sync up and she would get stuck with that alarm. Or mine would go off and she would go over because I'm sleeping straight through that sucker. And so, so she would come over and there's, there's this weird word on there. Well, what is it? It's the word to renew. Every morning I wanted a reminder of renewal, of redevoting, refocusing, renewing my soul I have been so desperate for God to be the only author of what to think and how to act and what to do, even if you all don't like it. And yet, over time, my need for renewal for the month of January had a lot to do with the fact that I'd given up on Hadash. I'd given up on this this idea. It's an instance of resuming an activity or state, manner of being, after an interruption. Another example is the replacing or repair of something that is worn out, run down, or broken. Again, I get it, I look refreshed, thanks. <laughs> Some of you are like, hey Drew, that last line, that's, that, that was you. You were worn out, run down, and broken looking. <laughs> Love you, thanks. Literally, there's a member of our church family who uh, has, has a, a business that takes care of helping people look a little fresher. They, they look a little more the way that they would want to be. It helps uh, correct some things that time and maybe diet or, or sunlight and other things have sort of made their face look a little the way they wouldn't want it. So one of our church family members provides uh, a service in their business that helps people look a little more the way they want to look and kind of put things back the way they ought to be. And that person had come to me several times over the, the recent year mentioning, you know, you might want to stop by sometime. And uh, they weren't mean, they weren't condemning, they were just like, hey, I see some things. And, uh, but what was interesting is I, I, I had a chance to speak with them recently and they're like, yeah, I don't think I should bother you as much anymore. And so this kind of thing was real and this kind of thing was a part of my story. But the renewal thing is really important for us. It's a theme throughout the entire Bible. And I, I think maybe for me leading our church family and for me thinking things through as, as a father, I need to wake up. I've needed to just sit alone with God, not the news, not anything, just, just this text, him 
prayer, and solitude, and let him talk, whatever he has to say. So I want to share with you a couple things today about how I did this and how I would encourage you to do it as well. One of the things is many of you might have trouble opening your Bible. You've opened your Bible and you aren't sure where to start, or maybe it seems like the language is distant and you aren't sure what to do with it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you here today right now, but I'm going to try if you'll let me. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of verses, and I'm going to show you how to think about this. So the first is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and the second one is in Romans chapter 8. So if you're Bible flippers, you want to do that, you can. I'll have it on the screen. This is where I always start. What I think of this book is important. If I think it's a list of rules that I need to follow, then I'm going to treat it that way, and I could miss. Because what if it's not a list of rules to follow, although there's certainly rules in here? But what if it's more? What if it's meant to approach me differently? What if I miss how to use this book? So there are spaces in this book that tell you what it's up to. You know, imagine if the Bible had legs and it was walking around. It has an agenda. It's doing stuff. And I think it's helpful for us to know what it's up to. Would you like to know what the Bible is up to? All right, here's one of the verses that helps us learn what the Bible is up to. All scripture is breathed out by God. Okay, so where does it come from? Does it come from people? No. People sort of mechanically put it on paper, so to speak but they were forced to in a sense. They were, uh, the word is inspired. God, you know this, and I know this, that God interacts in different ways with different things. When it comes to scripture, he didn't let people interact with it enough. We We would change so much about this book. So he might have let them use their vocabulary, let them use their life stories and experiences, but it was his truth alone that would find its way on the pages. And so this text, and we should know all scripture, not most of it, not the majority of it, not not just this piece or that piece, all scripture is breathed out by God, and what? Profitable. Everybody, I want you to take a look at the word profitable for just a second. If you ever see the word profitable, I want you to immediately think of the word deficit. Who in here would like to go home knowing that their bank bank accounts today, and this is recent trauma for some of you, so hang in there, but how many of you would be happy to know that you have a deficit in your bank account when you get home today? Raise your hands if you'd be excited about that. Nobody, good, we have, a, we have a plausibly reasonable room, great. Why does that matter? Every single thing in life has these two things at play, deficit or profit. And what the Bible is saying is that you exist with a naturally placed deficit. All scripture is breathed out by God and it is profitable, which means There are deficits in your life and mine that this scripture, these words are intended to fill. Does that make sense? It's profitable, which means there's an existing deficit where that profit would fit. Everybody got that? So I need to know that when I'm reading my Bible, whatever it is I need to be listening for, thinking about, and looking for, and waiting for, something that's going to take a deficit in my life and put something in its place that is good, that is right, that is true. So I need to come to my Bible knowing I'm in need and I need to have a sense of emptiness, excitability maybe, hopefulness, that I'm going to learn something that I need. First thing. Second thing is it's not just that it's profitable, but it's profitable for specific things, for teaching. Any of you feel like you could learn just a little more about God? Hands up? Just a little bit. I mean, some of you are like, man, not a lot. Talk to me afterwards. Uh, The The idea here is that we we are in a space where we need to learn. So the scriptures are now breathed out by God to teach you, to teach me. So when I took my time off, I went and read scripture, listening for myself to be taught whatever he wants to teach. My wife is a teacher. You can't walk into her classroom and ask her to teach you whatever she wants, whatever you want her to teach you. She is an algebra teacher. She used to teach science. So maybe you could squeeze a little science out of the conversation, but the reality is she's not going to teach you quantum physics. Why not? I mean, she probably could. She's kind of smart. But but the reality underneath it is like teaching is involved with what the teacher has to offer. If the teacher is God, sky's the limit. And so teaching me from God That opens up a whole set of things that I need to be listening for. It could be anything. It could be forgiving a childhood thing. It could be be planning to sell something that I care about a whole bunch. It could be anything. He's literally created everything that is seen and unseen by speaking. 
don't know what your words accomplished recently. Probably nothing that great. I'm hoping mine might a little this morning. Everything that God wants for instruction is needed in our lives. So teaching, not only that, for reproof, for correction. Anybody wake up this morning hoping to come to church to be corrected? Now you've identified why my job is so hard. The scripture which I'm supposed to preach from is supposed to be about correcting us. And you, you, you come in every morning not wanting to be corrected. How's this going to work? Well, that's, that's part of the approach recognizing that I have to submit to a space where I need to learn and I need to be corrected. Title, pastor, title, Christian, title, blah, 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 blah. I need correction every minute of my day, sometimes more than others. Some of you see it glaringly, but Jesus taught about that, something about a log and a splinter. You should look it up. Anyway, for correction and for training in righteousness. The Bible has an agenda, church at Maine. You have a deficit. It seeks to bring you something that would profit you. Open your scriptures, let him talk. Second all, Romans chapter eight. I'm sorry, let me finish this. That the man of God may be complete. This is God's goal. This is the outcome of Bible reading, that you would grow up. The word teleos there is complete. It's perfect, it's mature. That's the outcome of someone who is growing up in Christ. It doesn't mean you know how to recite the Bible, although that will come. It doesn't mean that you can answer effectively a large Bible quiz, although that's okay. It means that your heart looks, acts, and thinks like Jesus, naturally. That if I plug you into a space and I read the scriptures, I can't separate the responses that you give from the responses that Jesus gave. That is what a complete person of God formed by the scriptures will look like. Equipped for every good work. God has a goal in the Bible. Those whom he foreknew, Romans 8, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Think family resemblance. Rachel Rachel had all of us a few minutes ago turn around to each other. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but you guys, you don't have the same features. You don't. Some of you way don't. (laughs) I'm going to leave that alone. But if you need that, that lady I told you about earlier in our church that does stuff to the face, I'll, I'll tell you about her. So anyway, <laughs> point being, the Bible has two things especially in mind. That it is from God to train and correct everything within us to make us more like Jesus. And here is your, your, your stamp on it. That he, he predestined and desires the outcome of your life to be What? conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean you should dress like a tunic and grow a beard? We don't know that Jesus had a beard. It's just assumed, you know? We don't know how long his hair was. It's just assumed. But we do know that he was a first century Middle Eastern man. And so he probably wasn't wearing Armani. He probably wasn't, you know, but but I don't think he was wearing a space suit. I think he was fitting in the culture of the times and he was successful in doing those things. So maybe it's not how he looked that was being sought out. It's how he was received and how he interacted with the world around him. Being conformed into the image of Jesus means operating on a daily basis as Jesus would. One of the phrases Dallas Willard used uh, long ago, Dallas Willard was a philosopher. He was also a uh, Southern Baptist pastor and he uh, taught at USC for over 40 years in philosophy. But uh, Dallas Willard has a quote, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he lived your life right now. That's that's what the thing is. And so my month of January was intended to be a time of rest. That was the goal. I was gonna take some time off, I was gonna rest, I was gonna sleep some, and I was gonna focus on these things that God might want to bring to my mind. Now I know that some of you probably had a list of things you would like for Drew to address while he's off. Hillary also had a list of things she would like for Drew to address. (laughs) Not, not, not exempt from that list were honeydew projects and other things that were on the pro- process. But I had my own goal. And I, I put a video out right before I left, kind of sharing a little bit of what I was going to be doing. And it had to do with Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. So I'm going to read those real quick. And then I'm going to show you what really happened in January. Psalm uh, 19. This is what God intended for me to process personally on my own. Okay? Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. 
Church of Maine, the first thing I needed to do is I needed to sit alone with God and recognize there are things wrong with me that I don't see. And I've got people around me that would like to help me, but I need his voice to be the one to tell me first. I'm not saying he won't speak through you. I've got lots of people that tell me he speaks through them. Lots. They don't all agree, which draws conclusions for me. But I do know that I need to know for certain what God says to me about how I'm really doing. Am I really a curmudgeon? A little bit. Am I a little overbearing? Am I underperforming? Am I this? Am I that? Yeah. But what does God really want me to see? This is a prayer. So I start writing things out. I start thinking through, God, what's hidden in me that I don't even realize? And I start thinking about, who have I been mean to? That list got a little longer than I thought. There's like, who would probably wish that I would give an apology to them over something, over the last years or whatever? That, there's a list. Who thinks they're owed something from me? Whether it's true or not, they think it. There's a list. And I just started to process things. And, and then how have I been with my money? How have I been with my time? How have I been with my emotions? How have I been with all of this stuff? And I'm just, I'm asking God, show me what I can't see. Show me what's wrong inside of me. Just personally, forget pastor, forget, forget Hillary's husband, Ella's dad, forget all of that. Just you and me, what's wrong with me that I don't see that you would really wish that I would see? And I spent time working through it. Do you want to know one of the things? I haven't shared this with anybody yet, but do you want to know one of the things that I learned in that process? Now, this may not come as a surprise to some of you, but really it's, it's a two-parter. Um, I care too much what you think. I do. I'm afraid all the time that you're going to leave and go to the next church next down the street that's just a little more comfortable for you or a little easier to sit through or a little of this or does a little more of these other things. And I'm honestly convinced most weeks, a lot of you are probably on the fence about whether or not to come back the next week. That's how I feel. And I got to figure out how to sit in that space. And oh, by the way, the only reason I think that way, it's not new. It's because it's what a lot of us have done. I mean, let's be honest. For a majority of you, this isn't your first church. Now, I'm not saying you didn't leave the last church for the right reasons. I'm going to trust that you did. But if I'm going to shepherd you under God's rule, there's a pressure that's hidden in the fear of man that makes me want to keep you maybe longer than God wants you to be here. And it's a wrestling that I learned. The other thing it had to do with my childhood a little bit. It was, a, it was a hidden fault within me that I care too much about what I look like. I always, I want my hair to look right. I had to throw a ball joke. I've missed you. I care too much about what I look like. Ask Hillary what my closet looks like. It's horrible. I've got twice as many clothes as she does. I'm not joking. And this is stupid for me to admit, but it's, I want to be honest with you. I care too much about what I look like. And I realized that when I was a kid, and it, it took a while to kind of process through the real roots of this, but look, when I was a kid, I was the firstborn, so I didn't have an older sibling to like stand up for me anywhere. And I got picked on and beat up because of what I wore to school a lot. Like it happened pretty often. I got laughed at and made fun of and it was, it was pretty tough, you know? For most of middle school and high school, I hated humanity with a thorough passion. That hasn't changed as much as it should, but I'm getting better. And, and yet I would write a lot about these attitudes and these beliefs and these behaviors. God showed me, Drew, you're going to have to be who I made you to be for this church. I didn't bring you to be the pastor they want, and I didn't bring you to be the pastor that they think they should have. I need you to be who I made you to be for them, and you trust me. And that took probably two days of thoroughly painful, because I had to process through what that might mean. Yeah, but what if the church gets a lot smaller? What if, what if people start having other things they want to do, and there's more infighting and wrestling, and God's like, they're mine, not yours. And, and it's just, but, but, but can I be honest? Like, but that's not, any, that's, you, we can amen, and I amen that, but then the coming into the office on Monday and walking it out, oi! Like, I know that some of the things we're getting ready to preach are probably going to do more toe damage to you than I've already done. And you're like, yeah, that's going to be great, until it's you. And it's definitely going to be you. I've read enough ahead. We're all going to end being for it. Because we're going to go right after Jesus. Every single thing he said, taught, and did, we're going to deal with it on the face value for as long as it takes. 
and, and we're going to be the people of the Lord. And if that's nine of us, and I go back to being an electrician, and we're renting out this building to anybody that'll pay for it for anything at all, I'm not in charge of those things. But he told me, Drew, you must demote everyone else's thoughts of you forever. You will be loved by some, bothered by most, but you are mine. Follow me through this. So that was, that was and you might be wondering, oh great, we got to start looking for another church. No, I mean, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but out of this was deep, deep honesty with God. And he was talking to me. A lot of us have ideas about how we wish God would talk to them But I spent all of January asking God to just talk to me. I missed him. I missed him personally, the closeness that he and I have had over the years. I have a very weird journey on how I got here and how I'm in this seat or this role. It's a a peculiar path. Some of you would never approve of the way that I got here, but I'm here and you're stuck, so ta-da. But out of that, though, is a reality that the word is the word is the word. And the Spirit lords over us all what the Word must do. So I responded to that. And then, and then it goes on. It goes on in verse 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. God, what are the things that I just kind of jump to? Do you know what one of them is? Making everybody happy. Or wanting to at least try to. Now, if you really knew me, you would know that I actually don't want any of you to be happy. I don't think there's a lot of growth in happiness. I just don't. I don't mind if you have a good day, but I'm thoroughly happy myself if you're pestered good. <laughs> there's an old phrase like, you'll, 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 you'll walk better if you have a rock in your shoe. It'll help you pay attention to your steps more. It'll help you pay attention to where you're going and whether or not you should go there better if you have a rock in your shoe. But a rock in the shoe is unpleasant, right? Ta-da. So, keep your servant back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. God, what has dominion over me that I don't even realize? I wrote all those things out. I worked on I would encourage you, go back through these three verses, Psalms 19, verses 12, 13, and 14, and Kate, take a couple of weeks and just talk to God through these texts alone. Talk to him. See what he tells you. See what he shows you. Finally, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, before I went away on this, I told you that the goal was to seek rest. And I'm gonna kind of try to wrap things up here quickly, but I'm gonna push hard. January 2nd was my first day. January 1st wasn't really a day off. I was kind of finishing up, deleting some things and separating some things. That Monday, though, January 2nd, Hillary and the kids go back to school and I start with a blank piece of paper, an ink pen, and God in Scripture. Now, my friend Scott, he was in a a nursing facility and his care was was not working the way it ought and he was struggling quite a bit physically and mentally and emotionally and so I still needed to devote some sort of time and energy to make sure that he was at least cared for. God provided some miraculous ways for him to be cared for, perhaps better than he, he ever has been before. And it was answers for prayers that I prayed for 13, 14 years for him. And they came out better than I could have hoped. And Scotty's even with us in this room today. And so I can just tell you that my friend who I have loved and cared for and been a terrible friend to at many times, God still was caring for him in the midst of this. But January started with me still needing to be involved in some of that. It also started with sort of wrestling through an old process that I needed to find closure with. It also started with, and you're going to have fun with this, I was told by the elders that January was a month for me to seek rest. The first week, my dishwasher dies. Oh, wait for it. That ain't nothing. First week, dishwasher dies. Got to diagnose it, have the conversation, look at the bank account, then go buy a new one, pick out the new one, drop $600 for all of that, tear out the old one, put in the new one. Hey, God, how are we doing on the rest thing? The following week, we had a unique little scenario where Thursday started to rain and Friday morning, you would have all woken up to a lot of rain. Friday, that, it was early in January and we had a pretty good heavy rain day. Do you want to happen that morning? I was standing in my kitchen right over the, where the sump pump in my crawl space is and guess what I heard? Nothing. I heard a sump pump that was not in the mood to play. 
So I donned the clothes, you know, because I'm on sabbatical. I don the clothes, I go into the crawl space, I crawl around in there, I get to the sump pump, it's dead, it's toast, it's per- literally blew out the side, it's shorted out, it's, to- it's gone. Go to buy another sump pump, drop another $400, repop some things and fix all of that. How are we doing on our Sabbath rest, time of rest with the Lord so far? Then, uh, still working through a couple of other things, finishing up some things for Scotty to receive the care he needs and deserves, and then, and then, and then, Finally, I get a break, right? And in the end of January, that last week of January, I was gonna get to go away for a week to really have some time alone with God. So Sunday, Monday morning, I'm getting ready to leave. I pack up my stuff. I got it all sitting on the bed at home. Sunday morning, it's about 10 o'clock. You all were here. I wasn't, felt rested, totally, you know, like, okay, you know, dishwasher, yeah, sump pump, those are good stories. I learned from them. God was showing me things. Then I hear a gurgle noise in my kitchen sink which led me to the crawl space because I know how everything's wired and piped in the crawl space. So I go to the crawl space where I found something similar to the scene you would see uh, at the precipice of the falls of Niagara. Um, Turns out that my septic system backed up into my first floor bathroom, thus throwing sewage into my first floor bathroom and subsequently through said floor into said crawl space. So I canceled the trip I tell the elders, guys, I'm not going to be able to go away. That's just not going to happen. So I'll be back next week. And the elders are like, Drew, everything's like, God's got all of this. Go ahead and take the next week and, and take it off and go get this trip in. It was four or five days away. It wasn't anything crazy. I was, I was at a lodge in the middle of the woods in Missouri, basically. It was, it was very restful. But I had to sit around and go through all these other things. And here's one of the things that I want you to take away from what I learned from a dishwasher, sump pump. Except our house is still torn up. They're going to come in a couple of weeks. I think that we're going to get stuff fixed. Insurance is going to cover some of it. Here's what's fun about this. I don't know the exact number, but my Sabbath is going to wind up costing me about five grand probably, <laughs> give or take. <clears throat> now, you all still paid me while I was gone, but, and we can, if you don't like that, we can talk later. But either way, so I was paid to be away, but that definitely went to other people. And not only that, here's what God taught me. Something I've known up here, but I have real good stories now to apply to what I think I know. True, real rest only comes from God. Never your circumstances. You might think that your circumstances feel restful. You're probably not actually at real rest. And it took all of these things to make me taste, not literally as in the taste of sewage, but I could smell it and I ought not. The reality was that this was a major lesson day in and day out throughout the month of January that the Lord says, I will give you rest. You can unplug from this. And why is this important for me? I'm coming back to work, but I shouldn't change. The restfulness that I got to experience with him, presence of mind, sitting before him, listening to his voice, whether things here are chaotic, the world around us is on fire, or everything feels co- cozy and, and hunky-dory, doesn't matter. He alone, he alone is my rest. And so I learned at a new practical level how to walk that out and to deal with that. But finally, there's this, and this is the text I read at the beginning. Luke chapter 13, verses one through nine. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And, key word, so he told them a parable. That text that I just read you is being reinforced by this parable that Jesus teaches. These are not disconnected statements. Please hear this. 
Do you think that anybody else around you has it worse than you? Or do you think that you're better off than some? Or do you think that others need God more than you? Or do you think that somehow because, Drew, you're a pastor or you've been in church a long time that you don't need God as much every single day or to learn from him or be corrected by him or be taught by him every single day at an aggressive, deep level? Do you think that you don't need that as much as others? No, I tell you, you do need it every day, every ounce of your life as if you've never tasted it at all. You deeply need him. And he teaches in this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. What's the fruit he's looking for? A life of continual repentance. A continual turning to God on a regular basis. No matter how much you think you know, you are just as hungry for him to teach you, humble you, empty you at whatever price you must pay and you're hungry for it. You are deeply hungry for it. That's the message. That's the fruit he's looking after. He came seeking fruit and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I have found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Here was God talking to me. Drew, you've been the pastor of this church for a little over three years. How are you doing, Drew? And let me, let me put it on us. Church of Maine, how are we doing? What is the fruit over the last three years starting to look like? I would say there's been some really noticeable fruit recently. There really has been. But I wonder, are we where we have been called to be? Are we, are you individually, are we collectively, are we who we can be? His power, his word, his love, how would you measure where it's been so far? I'm just, I'm just processing out loud, church. I'm not telling you I have some sort of individual thing for any of you. This is what I was wrestling with from God. Drew, are you bearing the fruit that I have called you, created you? A fig tree doesn't bear apples, right? It bears figs. So God's kind of speaking to me. He's like, Drew, are you producing the fruit in this body of Christ that I have made you to produce? And then he asks this brilliant question, why should it use up the ground? Many of you know that soil has this incredible wealth of nutrients available to it, pathways for water and sustenance to sustain that tree to produce the life that tree is intended to produce. But what is Jesus saying in this parable? That it is possible to take up space in the orchard and never bear fruit and suck up all the nutrients. And the only way to stop it is cut it down. And so I got this warning from God, this, this situational wake-up call, deep down in here, and it's where it's really been. So I don't know if you're going to see any fruit that you think I ought to have. So that's really not my problem. I'm, he, we're talking. But I want to invite you to start talking too. If you're just beginning a journey with Jesus, or if you're just beginning a life with Jesus, what he's saying in this parable is that every other thing that you attach yourself to will kill you. God has given you a purpose and a life and it is in that definition and identity alone that you will find life. Everything else gets cut down. And some of you have tasted the fruit of a life that is beginning to be cut down because you've trusted in and taken a life from other things instead of from him. And so as I was sitting through this, I was remembering the invitation of God to abide in Jesus and to abide in the Lamb of God, to abide in the Word of Christ, to abide in Him alone. He defines how I think, how I talk to people, whether they receive it well or not. If you interview everybody in this room, everybody has a clearly different view of Jesus the further you press in, which is important because where we're gonna be going is we're gonna clear all that up for all of us. We're going to work through the Gospels together, starting in a few weeks. And we're gonna stay with Jesus, we're gonna be with Jesus, we're gonna work to become like Jesus, and we're gonna learn to do as he did. Say it the way he said it, listen the way he listened, and live the way he lived. And we're gonna pay the prices necessary to find that life with him alone, from the scriptures, guided by the Spirit. But I'm sitting in that space and I'm like, okay God, what does this mean for me personally? kind of already experienced a little bit of this in the crawl space. That manure thing kind of, I found some irony in God's teaching. Let's just say it that way. Church at Maine, one of the things that's necessary for every single one of you, those of you joining us online and those in the room today, 
You gotta let God take a shovel and start poking around your roots. For the fruit of your life to really flourish, you're gonna have to let him do this work on you personally. I know that you've got a list for your neighbor. I hear that. He's just not gonna interview at the end of your life about that list. He's gonna talk to you about his. And he wants to invite you to trust him in every corner of your life to see all the great good that he has for you. Yes, at an expense. Because there are things in this world that we have called good that we've made God. There are things in this life that we have trusted too much to make us happy, to make us validated in our individual communities. And by those things, we have made idols that tear down the love of Jesus in our lives. So I, I wanna tell you that this next year, and for me personally, this is what I have had to begin doing. Breaking up the fallow ground, as is said in the book of Hosea, I have gone after the personal roots. And I would encourage you to do the same. Look at all of the things that you're currently absorbing from your life to feed you and ask, are these things that are nourishing my roots and coming into the stem of the trunk of my life, are these things that are here, are they bringing life? Are they making beautiful leaves according to the tree that I am? Are they bearing the fruit in my life according to the tree I've been made to be? And don't get condemning or self-releasing, but be honest. How are you and God doing in this conversation? This was what I had. I didn't intend to land here, but he's sort of stubborn. If you sit with him long enough, you're gonna hear from him. Now, I never heard an audible voice, but I assure you, everywhere I turned, I was bumping into him, revealing what he wanted me to hear. So I stand in front of you today, hopefully as a friend, yes, as your pastor, but that's up to you. I'm here in that role, but whether or not you trust it and embrace it and submit to it, that's you. I can't make you, nor will I try in any way. But I will tell you that God has placed us here, as Rachel said so wisely earlier, placed us here to be a particular family during this season. Now, maybe you think a family ought to look a certain way and this and that or whatever, and sorry, I'm what you've got. But I'm here with you. And I want to invite you to learn together from Jesus Christ today and each day going forward what manure you need, what you need dug up around your roots to take everything that Jesus has said seriously enough to repent in every area of your life. Turn your eyes to Jesus in every part of who you are. Many of you have done that in many ways for years, but tomorrow you're gonna wake up and everything looks the way it used to. So I wanna invite you, as we close, I wanna invite you to pray a particular prayer with me. Now, in order to do that, you have to, one, trust that I've prayed about this prayer and I'm not leading you into some weird seance moment. Like, how crazy did Drew get while he was gone? <laughs> Pretty crazy. There's a book. I would encourage you, if you are a praying kind of person, maybe find a way to get it. It's not the end-all be-all for prayers, but it's a good start. It's a helpful start. It's called The Valley of Vision. And it was written by Puritans, so if you have issues with Old English, uh, maybe find an updated version that doesn't say thee, thou, thy, and the, whatever. Uh, but The Valley of Vision, is, it, it's a good place to start. And I'd like for you to close your eyes. I want you to practice a moment of trusting me as a shepherd that God has placed in your life. And many of you know more than me. But what if God chooses to use that in humility for us all? That I am clearly in some cases a more immature and younger brother and yet God designs this relationship for us to learn together from him. So I wanna invite you to close your eyes. And I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna read this out loud as a prayer. And as your eyes are closed, here's what I want to invite you to consider. I want you as best you can, as best you can, to try to get these words to be your words. Don't fake it. Try to feel as if they can be yours, okay? Oh, my forgetful soul. 
Awake from your wandering dream. Turn from chasing vanities. Look inward, forward, upward. View yourself. Reflect upon yourself. Who and what are you? Why here now? Also reflect on what you soon must become. You are a creature of God, formed and furnished by Him, lodged in a body like a shepherd in His tent. Do you not desire to know God's ways? O oh God, you injured, neglected, provoked benefactor. When I think upon your greatness and your goodness, I am ashamed at my insensibility. I blush to lift up my face, for I have foolishly erred. Should I go on neglecting you when every one of your rational creatures should actually love you instead? and take every care from now on to please you? I confess that you have not always been on my thoughts, that the knowledge of you as the end of my being has been strangely overlooked, God, that I have never seriously considered how much my heart needs you. But although my mind is perplexed and divided, and although my nature is perverse, my secret inner person is desperate for you. So, God, let me not delay coming to you completely now. Break the deadly enchantment that binds my wicked affections day in and day out and bring me to a happy mind that rests in you alone. For you have made me and cannot forget me. Let your spirit teach me the vital lessons from Jesus Christ because I am slow to learn. And would you please hear my broken cries? Amen. Renewal means this. Sorry, I need to jump ahead. Whoever says that he abides in Jesus ought to walk in the same way way in which he walked. Starting next Sunday, I'm going to preach on the way it was, and I'm going to show you intimately how you were created in Eden with every ounce of human flourishing, joy, dancing, and celebrating, and full, unconstrained happiness was ours and is still available. After that, We're going to preach the way it was. Then we're going to preach the way it went. And we're going to look at how broken the garden really became when the serpent deceived Eve and Adam befell as well. Then we're going to look at the way things stayed, how the patriarchs, the kings, the judges all strove over and over and over to make God right in their lives, and yet they failed over and over. Does that sound familiar to any of us? Yes. Then we're going to look at the way God waited. We're going to look at how the prophets patiently called God's people in exile and in the kingdoms to turn back to God, and God patiently waited. And then for Easter, we're going to look at, guess what? The way he fixed it. And we're going to celebrate and rejoice, and then we're going to follow that by beginning to enter into a life together of preparing the way. Starting with John the Baptist and the life that God has called us to live together now, with all that we know and all that we do, we're going to learn how to walk in step with the truth of the gospel, obeying Jesus every step of the way. Why? Renewal. But particularly, why? Because an instance of resuming an activity or state after what? An interruption. Did sin interrupt your relationship with God? Yes. Does sin interrupt your life right now? Yes. So what does renewal look like? You take the forgiver of sins and you place him in your life in every corner and you let the war begin knowing the victory is already yours. 
God loves you, has come for you, has redeemed you in Jesus Christ. He has promised only good for you. Even in the space of hard days, he will come through. Let's face the interruption head on and let's follow our Savior who has already overcome. And let's do that this day and not wait for another day of replacing or repairing the something in our lives that is worn out, run down, or broken. Jesus is none of these. And Christ in you is the hope of glory. Let's pray and then let's sing together as we end our time. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. But if we can get a little more honest now, there isn't a corner of our lives that doesn't need a sense of honesty and redeeming. Help us not to believe we have gone too far in our faith to no longer need to be instructed by your Son. May we turn fully to all godliness and holiness without anxiety, fear, or control, but for the joy that is found in you alone. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. One last note. The elders and I agreed last fall that I would take the month of January off. Rashad helped push for this to happen. So I said yes, but as you noticed, as I told the story, that that month of January ended up going longer. And I was gone longer than the 30 or so days that I said I was gonna be gone. And when I came back, and you gotta think through all of the things that happened, right? That delayed and delayed and this and that and the septic system backing up and failing and all of those things. And then the trip later. So Rachel, when I came back, the staff and I, we had a, a really tender series of conversations together uh, just this last week. But Rachel over here had the nerve to ask a question. Hey, how many days were you gone? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, was, I mean, I was going to be off January. That was the agreement. Then I took it like an extra week or so, whatever. She goes, but how many days was it? I was like, I don't know. She goes, you should go look that up. Figure it out. So I go January 2nd. I'm like, okay, January 2nd, that was my first real day. Da, 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 kind of math. And I was like, no way. I kind of went back again. I'm like, nah, that's, uh, math can't be right. And again, I'm married to a math teacher, so I got to get this right. So I'm like, do, 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 do. My first day away, seeking the Lord in rest, to my last day away, February 10th, 40 days. So I'm not saying anything over that. God wanted 40 days. I wanted 31. I was good with 31. I still feel like 31 would have been enough. But either way, do whatever he tells you to do. and Trust him. His outcomes are better anyway. See you next week.